Good afternoon, everyone. We're super excited to get started. We want to make sure that we stay on time, given this important topic. Uh, I must admit, I'm semi-giddy to just be in the flesh with people again. Uh, so thanks for joining us. My name is Ami Eubanks Davis. Uh, you can read me more about myself and my organization in the app, but in a nutshell, we help students who are first in their families who go to college come out with a strong first job, and we do that in partnership mainly with large state schools, including San Jose State here in the state of California. I am joined today by this illustrious panel, uh, and we are super excited to have a real conversation about what does it really look like to go from education into employment and really think about the role that technology plays. So we are going to hear from Richard Ludwig from University of St. Thomas, Mary Hawkins from Bellevue University. We're also gonna hear from Sean Gallagher from Northeastern University, Chris Graham from Workforce Education Solutions National University System, as well as Brett Frazier from Kaplan University Partners. So please help me in welcoming this amazing panel. All right, so we're gonna start with Richard, right to my left. What has your institution been doing to help prepare your students on their path to career? And why or what makes what you're doing unique? And as you answer this question, please describe the student pro profile of your institution as well. All right, thank you, Ami. Um, first of all, let me start with the profile because that sort of sets the stage. Our university is in Houston, Texas, and as some of you may know, Houston is demographically, at least that's what demographers tell us, the most diverse city in America. And so our student body in large part represents that diversity. So we have three designations of minority status from the Department of Education. So our student body is about 60, 65% Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, you name it, we have students in that, in that demographic band, right? So that gives us a great richness of leaders for the future. Our students, many of whom are um, first generation students. A program that I'll, I'll give you just as an example, um, is one that we call the Rising Stars Program. And if some of you are familiar with the Cristo Rey model in high school, this is Cristo Rey goes to college, right? So what we do is we take a student and pair that student with a business and they have four years or whatever it works out to be with the employer. So that pipeline, that talent pipeline, and what we, we like to describe to the employers is you're getting a chance to try out some amazing leaders of the future. And we know that Houston represents what America is going to look like in about 20 or 30 years. And if we can crack that code, which we are, then we're putting people in the boardroom for the next generation. So that's what our leadership looks like. Rising stars quickly takes um, a student and gives the employer a chance to get that hands-on understanding of what that talent's going to look like. Is it going to work out? And for the student, they get an amazing opportunity to see what work-life balance is when you're entering into a lifelong learning prospect. And for the student, the, um, the money is very minimal that they have to come out of pocket with. So with federal and state aid, plus the aid that the employer gives, it's about $6,000, they're ready to rock and roll and they get a great education and a great experience. Has anything shifted because of COVID or is your profile pretty much the same? The only thing that has shifted because of COVID is that our enrollment has reached record levels. Wow, there you go. How about you, Mary? Can you tell us a little bit about Bellevue and your student profile? And also has anything shifted since COVID? Sure, glad to. So I'm going to take a little bit different approach. And um, we're a university that serves quite wide range of students. But I'm going to talk about education to employment with full-time working adults, which we have a huge majority of. And I haven't figured out yet, and maybe there are some people in the room who figured out ways to take working adults and give them internship, apprentice, and other opportunities without them quitting in a flexible way. I think there's a solution out there, but I'm not there yet. So what we did, I took a different approach. I thought the one thing that I can really do to help those people who are in jobs 
And in companies, sometimes that they love, they want to stay with a the company, they want to advance with the company. You've heard a lot of speakers today talking about that retention. And um, the analysis we've done um, through our human capital lab of students whose companies invest in them is that they have a much higher retention than others. So I think um, our ability to help those students advance in those education programs is really key. So several years ago, we really looked at our programs and said, do we know whether we're teaching the right skills or not? And I was really fortunate, happened to be at a conference, and we used Burning Glass, and we used um, Department of Labor data, and all of the, um, what do you call it, advisory committees, all those kinds of things that I think we all do, accreditors, licensure, et cetera. But we, um, I saw a presentation by MC, um, which does a really great machine learning run on all of the job postings nationally, um, probably internationally now, on a very regular basis, and pulls out for jobs a really robust set of skills, experiences, knowledge that students need. So I was really fascinated by the data that they had, um, the economic modeling that they did, I took one of our programs, um, which we thought was the best and the most likely to have all the right skills in it because it was new, the faculty was like motivated, um, students were getting great jobs, and we, we really didn't do very well when we matched it up to analyze, were the skills in there? So we realized that faculty think they're teaching the right skills, and faculty may be teaching the right skills, but it's really hard to pull out of the curriculum. So we took that analysis and recreated our whole curriculum development process. So now what we do is look at those emerging careers or look at the programs that we've got. We go to those databases as well as the other traditional things we all use, and the faculty start a design map of the program Remember, we have just a couple minutes here to take through. I'm not doing gen ed, I'm not doing electives, I'm not doing any of that. This is just the major. Take the major through, look at what skills, experiences the students have. We do a kind of a scrum process iterative with our design team and end up with the program where those skills, those knowledge, those things are really pulled out so that a student who's completing it knows what they've got. We've taken it further and there's a lot of collegious people in the room and I know I'm not supposed to give too many plugs, but they've really helped us. We've added it to the web and now we're doing machine learning in the search that students do with a partnership with Google and Collegius to find out when students want those skills, are those those skills, where are the programs, where are the colleges they go to. So I'm really assured that the programs we're running and we've got a robust process. We're about through 12 of 80 programs. It's going to take us a while. I know what I next want to do with those um, skills, but my effort is to take adult learners and really make sure they have the skills the ability to communicate those skills, the confidence to apply for those advanced um, jobs or to take a risk and, and go for a promotion in their company. That's awesome. Sean, tell us about Northeastern. Sure, and uh, Mary gave me a great segue there in terms of what we're doing with experiential learning and adult learners. Um, so Northeastern University with our main campus in Boston is a global diversified private research university. Uh, tens of thousands of students and we're known um, over the last century for a cooperative education program. Uh, and so students, whether it's undergrad or grad, you can come and study computer science and uh, you, know, you do your, your regular courses and then you go out, you work at Amazon, you come back, you apply it, and, and you continue. We do that at the undergraduate and graduate level for a traditional student who lives in Boston or London or Silicon Valley or elsewhere, Seattle, places that we have campuses. Um, and that's what we're known for. But that, uh, that type of experiential learning is really set up to serve a student who's studying full time and can stop and gain skills in the workforce. Uh, but Northeastern also, for decades, uh, has been focused on online learning and serving adult students through degree programs and certificates and employer partnerships. And adult learners can't, you know, they're, they're working in a job and maybe their employer is supporting them. Uh, and to Mary's point, all the research shows that the more employer engagement and supervisor support you have at work, better retention, better outcomes. So in any event, we created something that we call the experiential network, uh, which is basically online projects. And then to your question about the pandemic, 
that was already running, but then all of the experiential learning had to, had to go virtual. Uh, and we're doing some research studies on that. We're partnering with other institutions. So uh, what I would uh, advocate or, or argue for is experiential learning is a, is a spectrum. Uh, it's a continuum, and there's been so much energy on apprenticeships, where you think about cooperative education for an undergraduate student, uh, but you also have all kinds of micro-internships and project opportunities, and um, you know, obviously a lot of this conversation is about maybe what we would call alignment, the world of, of higher education, finding a way to line up to maybe what skills employers need, uh, but we really think it needs to go much more toward integration. And that is the heritage of the word cooperative education. It's cooperative between the institution and the employer. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of creative things that could be done if we can break down those barriers. And uh, to the other part of your initial question, the fact that much of this is now all digital, we can, we can start to get there because there's a blurring of the online experience, the, the at work experience. You might be working at home. You can get the data. You can have algorithms. You can build platforms. Uh, and so it's an exciting time. That's great. So Chris, we'd love to hear about national university system. What makes you similar to the traditional universities? What makes you different? Excellent, thank you. So national university is part of the national university system, which is comprised of City University of Seattle, North Central University, and then National University. So national, our flagship, was founded in 1971. It was founded as a working adult university. So the learning development director of General Dynamics, at the time in 1971, his, empl his employees were deploying for the Vietnam War. They had work schedules. That, uh, so and a lot of times in deployment, they're only given 30 days notice before they're gonna ship out. So so the, so the employees couldn't commit to a 13-week semester at a state institution or a 10-week quarter system. So what he did is he created a university for his employees there so that they could go on and get their bachelor's or master's degrees while still fulfilling their obligations both with the military and with work. And then so as we grew, we kind of became famous for that one course a month format for, for people so that they can go on and take one course at a time while they're working so they're not, they're not juggling three or four projects every time. And so as we started with that partnership, we started to build out partnerships with school districts, um, healthcare um, systems and institutions, banks, public safety agencies. So oftentimes when we're looking to, to bring skills to our students or to educate them, we work with the employers. So we had one large partner who, um, there, it was the military group within that organization and they were they're hiring veterans into the organization and they and they were admittedly not doing the best job of of recognizing the skills picked up in the military and how those translated to their organization. And so they were uh, on the floor or in the fulfillment centers. So what they'd notice is that there wasn't a huge ocean between where they needed to go in order to be a programmer or an analyst or what have you. Maybe they needed a program maybe they needed a programming language or they needed no SQL for data mining or something like that. And so what we did is we created a program for them so that, so that the students could go and just pick up those skills, that they could have those move up in those positions, but we made them so that they were stackable, so that the student wanted to go on and to get that bachelor's degree that they could. That's amazing. All right, so Kaplan, how do you partner with these kinds of great universities? First, it's great to be here with everybody in person. Um, long time, right? Um, for about 80 years, Kaplan has helped individuals uh, prepare for success in school, traditional college, uh, success in the workplace, um, early stage you know, career success, as well as long-term you know, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, you know, it started out as most of our business was direct to individuals, right? Direct to consumer. Um, a vast majority today of our of our business is helping companies and you know, universities um, to think about the way you know, we prepare students for ultimately for very successful long-term careers. So, so a lot of, of what we, we've already heard from my good colleagues really fits with what we do every day with both universities, where we offer, yes, you know, online programs to help working adults and some underserved populations, uh, but really increasingly we're working with universities to help better prepare students for the workplace, um, to augment what is you know, typically an underserved career services department, um, to offer non-degree credentials in the traditional university space, not just as a bolt-on, but actually in combination with degrees and degree pathways, which you know, if you talk to any you know, employer, what they're really looking for these days is someone with you know, great communication skills, think critically, 
global knowledge and understanding, sounds a lot like you know, traditional liberal arts degree, but also a, an in-demand industry credential. And that's really the space that, that Kaplan's playing in. We're, we're also doing some really in innovative work with corporations, and to the point of some of my colleagues, ultimately helping corporations figure out how they leverage the great assets and capabilities of universities to do that job that, frankly, they're just not equipped to do, right? Reskilling and upskilling in the you know, many thousands, if not millions of people globally in a workforce is not something that, that most companies you know, are as prepared to handle as some of our good, good colleagues in higher ed. So that's a little bit about what we're doing and really excited to talk further about you know, some of our colleagues up here and, and what we're doing in the space. That's great. So we've gone from your traditional undergrad student to working adults to veterans, um, and I'm sure also the certificate uh, uh, programs as well. I'd love to hear from each of you for a couple minutes on the role of technology and the limitations of technology. This is a ed tech conference, and so it would be great to really hear how could technology continue to develop your students, make it easier for you in terms of what you're doing, um, and where do you think are the limitations? So we'll start actually with you, Sean. Okay, um, so uh, blended learning. Pre-pandemic uh, is something that we had been implementing, writing about, studying, doing, um, and you know, for for largely for the working adult student. But now, of course, in our post or still during, but eventually after COVID reality, uh, is I think like we'll see in the workplace. I don't think we're going to go back to a world that's either just online or just in person. Uh, and so I think there's tremendous potential there to do it thoughtfully, to do it in, in a way that's well designed and where you capture data. Uh, we, we, for a while, uh, and are still investing in software platforms and learning science to try to have students be able to capture their competencies uh, and what they're learning while they're out on the job or in the classroom and to be able to tag things and reflect on it, right? So there's all kinds of tools that you can create and implement uh, especially when you get that blurring between uh, the workforce and learning online if it's in your dorm room uh, or in some other context. So I, I would say uh, even though it's not necessarily something that's new, thoughtfully designed blended learning that maximizes uh, the power as we have here of in-person live interaction um, with uh, w what you can do in, in terms of the online. That's great. Mary, what about you? Well, thinking about the um, process I just described where we're <clears throat> really using the, the systems and the data, it's a very data-driven um, basis for curriculum. The faculty and the, the institution applies the art to that for the learning and, and individualizing it. But I still think that we get really um, kind of rough data from the corporations. The data that we're using to figure out what they want is coming from their job postings. And by no means am I saying that that's incorrect or wrong. But it isn't really telling us what the culture of the company is, where the company's going. How, how, do, they, how do they take those skills and what's some, some mapping throughout a corporation? I think that um, there, there's, there's gaps that we've got that data could solve could pull out from companies. It would take partnerships with um, both the data companies who are willing to pull it out and the corporations who are willing to share it. But it would really help. And I think all of us, even though we're doing the teaching, I think all of us as employers know we don't have great ways to help our employees understand here's your path on, on skill acquisition and here's the different forks in the road where you can go other ways. So is they're developing those skills, and we know they want to, because they, they come to college a little bit back and forth, which, which we get um, some chagrin about, but essentially they're kind of doing it in a just-in-time way, and that, that's okay. But it's, it's a, there's gaps between the data that we're using, the data that we could use, and the needs that we could better fulfill, both for corporations and also to, to help the student, student employee make appropriate choices about where they want to go and what they want to do. So I think that it's, it comes back to, and we talked about it, we got pieces of it. it it's, not like a, it's not like a big circle. It's kind of chop here and chop there. So it's a bit more like a jigsaw puzzle than a picture. <laughs> 
Chris, what do you think? Well, I think for if we're talking about job skills for employment, and, and talking with the employers, it's, it's funny because usually you'll start with the tech skills or the specific hard skills that, that they're, they're looking for individuals to have. And a lot of the technology is great right now to teach a coding language or to teach some of those other tech skills. But then you have the conversation about the soft skills and the human skills. And that's when the conversations become a little bit less specific and, and sort of harder to get your hands around. And in terms of training for those soft skills, because they talk about wanting the critical thinking, the listening, the communication skills, the empathy. but not necessarily having all the solutions to do that. And so I think so, sort of the gaps in, in the technology are some of the things that, that and I think we've heard it a few times today, you know, today in, in all, all of the sessions, is that really having a lot of those solutions for the more human skills or soft skills out there. Yeah. Brett? You know, at a basic level, technology allows you to scale, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, faster, cheaper, better, the old adage. And I think that really fits here. When we think about some of the major issues facing our economy, our globe today, and the intersection of education into to those things, I'll give you two two examples that are close to home. You know, one is, you know, we have the continued increase in, in need for clinical health professionals, right? Globally, um, the question is how you do that um, when there is a finite number today of clinical rotation spaces, of uh, preceptors, that's a really big challenge for many of you know, universities and others who are trying to build that next big, huge you know, wave of folks who need, who's, where jobs are needed in the clinical health professions. So I think the question of technology there is not replacing that experience, but augmenting with AI tools, with virtual lab simulations that are out there today. If you think about doing that on a, on a very frequent and scalable basis, that enables you to serve more people at, frankly, a lower total cost in, in an effective manner, not replacing you know, humans, not replacing that rotation entirely, but just make that a, a much more scalable venture and, frankly, lower cost to serve global folks. Um, the, uh, the second one um, is closer to home because of what we're doing at Kaplan. Um, we are going to be uh, working on a scalable career services solution um, that actually helps universities uh, provide domain experts in industries and in jobs. So envision some one of your students who is a sophomore and thinks they want to go be a, you know, a, a financial analyst at UBS. Right? Universities just don't have, no matter how big or small, don't have that capability at scale to actually offer a coach or someone who can provide that direct knowledge and expertise about that particular job. So we're actually enabling technology platform mm -hmm. to give universities that opportunity to use you know, coaches, industry recognized coaches to augment you know, that typical career development process. And we think that's a very sort of, it's intuitive. It enables a better experience with a human and enables that to scale very rapidly. And I think, you know, just as we're thinking about the challenges of training up, you know, a whole new generation of workers, retraining them for 21st century jobs, I think we have to, to go to the core of what technology does, and that's faster, cheaper, better. Richard, what do you think? This is a great question, because it's, it's really, you know, the pandemic was a tragedy, and it was also a great catalyst. So before the pandemic, our undergraduate programs held almost nothing online, right? No electronic or digital assets. We had put in place a program that we were going to launch. We just stepped on the accelerator. And what that allowed us to do was go from almost nothing to being named the best online university in Houston within six months. And what that did was point out to us something that I've, I've heard mentioned here a lot, and that is the digital divide. Some people say it's like 5%, you know me. For us, it was 20 to 25% of our students didn't have a device and they didn't have an on-ramp to high-speed internet. So what we have instituted is a device for all and a dongle for all, if you will, right? To give everybody their own on-ramp to high-speed internet and the capacity to have the technology. Now that's the basic, right? So there was a story I was reading uh, in a book recently, uh, The Sea We Swim In. And the story goes something like this. Two fish were swimming along in the ocean and the one fish says to the other fish, Boy, the water's nice today. The second fish says, what's water? And for us, that's the goal about how we digitalize our university so that the mindset of our students, 
the capacity to deliver at distance or in the classroom with digital technology is, is going to be the basic starting point. So the mindset is a digital world for us. So everything from additive manufacturing to AR, VR, XR, those are the kinds of programs that we will incorporate into a world, a university that has perhaps the most highly regarded PhD in Thomistic thought. Right? That doesn't get much more liberal artsy than I that, right? Well. <laughs> right? So imagine the blending of those two capacities in the leadership of the future. And that's where we think we're going. The other piece of this is, it's not just for those people who are uh, already on track, and maybe even though they're first generation and the parents don't speak English. We've instituted, at, with leveraging our new digital capacities, new programs that are high paying, skills oriented, because we believe that the democratization of education is for all people. And so as we continue to set records in enrollment growth, our, our tribe, if you will, continues to grow by thousands. And that's one of the things that technology and the leveraging of that has been able to do for our institution of now about 4,000 students and we're continuing to grow. That's great. Um, my final question is actually gonna be about the democratization of, of education and the role that technology has. So I wanna make sure that I leave a strong five to seven minutes for that. Um, so the next question, which is our second to last question, anyone can answer it. Um, everyone doesn't have to answer it, of course. Uh, but if you could wave a magic wand and or think about the different panels you've heard, the ideas that you've heard, what have you not heard? Uh, that you think the technology uh, folks, especially the investors, should be thinking about? Okay. Right <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wearing the cool glasses because I'm the cool kid. No, I'm not the cool kid. I'm definitely not the cool. cool kid. But I'm wearing these glasses because I have a low vision deficit. I'm blind, but I can still see some things, mm -hmm. right? Um, we talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion especially at this conference so far. One of the areas that I haven't heard mentioned is how we bring people who are differently abled mm -hmm. into that realm. Now, technology offers a great leveling up, right? And, and I think how we consciously engage with that is really important. The other piece that I would love to hear from the investors and others, because usually when I talk about our Rising Stars program, I have a line of CEOs out the door who say, I want to get me some of that leadership for tomorrow. Um, we need the technology that will connect our stars of the future, the Rising Stars, with the employers who desperately need that diversity and talent. And we've been, have a great ground game, right? We're one to one and we can connect and do all that. But the scale is such now that we need the technology to make that connection. So what we're doing at the University of St. Thomas in Houston is asking capitalists, venture capitalists, technologists to join us. We already have on our campus game developers, feature film producers, you name it, because we have commercial buildings and we are partnering with the tech sector in a real symbiotic relationship. We want you to join us in this democratization of education and leveraging technology for what comes next for the human family. That's great. I'm happy to go. Um, I think tomorrow night we are giving a Lifetime Achievement Award to Western Governors, the founders of Western Governors University, right? And yet, to me, there's a surprising lack of dialogue here and demonstrable examples in the last 20 plus years since WGU you know, did that groundbreaking you know, outcomes-based, competency-based learning model. There, there's really, a, surprising to me, a lack of dialogue around how you just completely change the model of traditional education yet and by the way some of my colleagues up here are you know are the few exceptions that are thinking differently about about this business but yet you look at the demands that we have today from an economic perspective right 10 million what yesterday day before 10 million unfilled jobs more than those looking for jobs suggests clearly there's a disconnect between the needs of the workforce and those that have the call it 21st century skills to be successful. And you're not going to, in my opinion, you're not going to see um, success in really moving the needle demonstrably 
toward getting a larger and more diverse pool of individuals who are able to get the skills they need for those 21st century jobs until you re completely rethink the model and, and frankly the cost of that access to that next job. Right? There will always be an opportunity and a need, in my view, for a traditional, quote unquote, traditional four-year degree and of course traditional master's programs. But right now, I think that we need to adopt sort of a playbook out of our good colleagues from WGU and think, just think differently about how you offer you know, programs, education in bites that allow it to be more usable for the training and upskilling of a very diverse workforce for what we need today in our country and our world. You know, one of the, um, you got my brain going on a couple of things, but one, one of the um, things that is possible now that I don't know that all colleges realize is that you can work with the accreditors and through the Department of Education to get federal financial aid for the short courses. Mm -hmm. And that was not true before. <clears throat> the students had to, you had to encourage the students essentially to kind of project that they may get a degree somewhere. And so these short course form courses that they're taking are actually part of a degree program. But honestly, now you can get outside of that. I think the um, other interesting thing, going back to the, the parsing of skills, um, one of the things that we hear is communication, critical thinking, all of us, and you get it from every employer. So what, what is meant by communication? We had an example where our faculty, when they think communication in, the, in writing, when we think of writing, our faculty go to what? essays? Okay, how long is it? Two pages? Is it three? This is the diversity of the writing assignment, more or less. But, you know, we, we talk about, or speech, but what is the communication? Communication for nurses who are changing shifts is critical relay of important patient information that they have to understand between the two. Critical information for a security officer may be problems with buildings or issues with that. Information, and I know um, we have a huge um, automotive dealership that spans several states. They do not trust their employees anymore to write emails to the clients. They have canned emails to write that they, they can modify and, and fit in. And I think if we could use the technology to parse that better, we can teach it. I'm certain that if I told the English teachers, you don't need to grade 50 essays every other week. They might even be happy about it. But it's it's really understanding how do, what is it that what is it that they need to teach in writing? What is it they need to teach in communication and critical thinking? And I think that I kind of am thinking about the portfolio of experience that you talked about. If we could get artifacts from businesses mm -hmm. to let students work on real world problems that, that companies are facing, I don't know about the rest of you, but I thought if I have to do one more payroll problem in my accounting class, I think I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> <clears throat> I always knew, I, I did a lot of math, I always knew when I didn't have it right, if I ended up with a fraction, <laughs> a point two at the end, I got to go back in and find it because these come out in whole numbers. There is no fraction in the problem that, that we were getting. So I think that coupled with the um, skills, the experience, working with employers, it's getting better knowledge, understanding uh, data on what can we use, what artifacts are out there. And I'm thinking that that portfolio that you've got may be a solution to that. And you're talking to companies about mentors. Could we also talk to them about getting Give us some of the samples of the work your folks are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And I was, I was going to say that experiential learning platforms so that you can do it. And we have some, some platforms and projects in that regard. But, but recognizing also that this is crossing over in the workforce, human capital management and, mm -hmm. you know, HR systems. And none of it's quite there yet. And these systems for skills like LinkedIn and so on. There are now that all these platforms and intermediaries where online learning is happening or where our students are going to, you know, document their competencies back to competencies and skills. And, you know, there's a vast array of data and algorithms where there's value being created and also, you know, it sort of belongs to private and public companies 
and maybe not the universities. Uh, and there's opportunities to sort out those connections and to integrate yeah. and to build like some new networks that give us a better understanding. So this is a great launch point for the final question. So the head of all of LinkedIn talent actually was uh, speaking to a group connected to the cafe in Chicago, which is also a part of this new project called the 1954 Project that's all about how do you help uh, young folks in particular who are black ensure that there's economic mobility over time. And one thing that he said was that if you live in a neighborhood where the average salary is $120,000 or go to a certain college, your likelihood of having a very strong network is high. So there's become a real conversation around college versus credential versus what have you as we think about economic mobility. And so I'd love to hear in a lightning round, we can all see the clock in front of us, uh, a minute or, or 30 seconds or so. What do you, where do you land? What do you think? I'll go ahead and start. I don't think we have to land on one or the other. Why can't you do both? As you're starting to build out skills and contents, why can't you build those so that they can stand alone on their own? People could have those skills, but that they could still stack towards a degree if the, if the student wants it to, because the degree is still an economic equalizer. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. It's both and, right? And oh, by the way, to, to, to Mary's comment, you know, we're still talking about degreed and non-degreed credentials, mm. right? Where both of those types of sort of credentials have accrediting bodies. Okay, you can't you know, go out and take a securities industry essentials or series six, series seven exam unless it's accredited by, accredited by a governing body. So I think in the next few years, I'm hoping you know, that differentiation is gonna be, gonna be gone. It's just silly to me at this juncture. Um, I, I think, again, to my previous comments, I think the number one thing we can do is to um, change the entire construct of what you know education is to to those who today don't really believe it's for them. And I think until we get over that hurdle, and, and I think that that requires us to th to think differently about the degree or the credential, whatever we want to call it. It also requires us to address, I think, an affordability issue that is pretty pervasive now. And again, I think we we solve those two challenges. I think we will see that naturally. Um, albeit in a difficult way, it, those will view, everyone will view education as a pathway toward a better job, a better life. Great. Mary, Richard, Sean, in that order. Oh, okay. So I think that um, compared to where we were when I started in education, we've just gone miles in, in terms of ability. We now have data. We have systems, we have the power. There's missing pieces, we've talked about them and we can, we can do that. But I think we're in a really strong place. And I remember um, when I first started talking about even online education, I was out in Las Vegas at a conference and I was doing the 10 myths that it wouldn't replace faculty and it wouldn't replace institutions and going through that, that you never had any human interaction. I think technology has enabled us so strongly to connect in so many ways and to create so many different paths and to integrate across systems and, and open doors that I feel real optimistic. I can always find the ones I want to fix real quick because I'm impatient, but I really think technology is, is We've done some leapfrogging over the last few years, and especially the last two, to set us up for a really strong way forward. But I think we have a lot of work to do. Right. Richard? I think the question of college versus credential is a false dichotomy, mm -hmm. right? I'm on, I'm on the both and crew. And the focus always has to be on the dignity of the human person and the authentic good of our human family. That is at the heart and core of what we do and how we are integrating technology and the digital mindset into the timeless um, learnings that our humanities background teaches us. The Lord gives us our soul. He also gives us the opportunity to connect with one another to share that love. And that's the basis of what we do. And I also want to say our chief innovation officer, Bina George, is here. So happy birthday, Bina. Oh, yes. Happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. What a human connection right there. Sean. Uh, so building social capital and cultural capital through quality job experiences that are integrated with the learning, right? They don't have to be stapled on. You don't want it, to... It's great to build an experience on a resume and to have a job where maybe you're getting coffee for somebody or, you know, doing some paperwork, but 
you know, those thoughtful job experiences, I think, um, are, are very important for everybody to have. College versus credential, though. Your Northeast. Well, that, credential. that too can be a both and. And yeah, a lot of my research focuses on credentialing. And I mean, the degree is, is here to stay. Uh, but these, these new forms of credentialing and work experience and so on can be complements. They don't have to be substitutes. Awesome. Thank you all so much for spending your time with us. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you.